Okay, so uh, good day everybody and welcome to this conference. And uh, today I'm uh, going to show you uh, things that we do in my lab uh, with regard to comparing the genetics of modern humans to other humans that are more uh, ancient and whether we can or cannot uh, say uh, something about uh, their cognitive abilities. Um, so what I do is uh, molecular evolution and the main tool in molecular evolution is what is called comparative genomics. That is you take the genome of species and you compare them to one another and you study about uh, different evolutionary um, uh, processes uh, through the similarities and the differences between these genomes. When coming to study human evolution, usually one of the most interesting things that you are looking for is what is unique at the genomic level in humans. And until very recently we could only compare genomes of living species, so uh, uh, in humans we had to compare them to uh, to great apes and there is a problem here because even if you identify something in our genome that is unique to humans you usually cannot tell when along this very long branch here that may be a few several million years where along this branch this uh, this unique feature had been entered the human genome and whether it is unique to ourselves or maybe we share it with many other a homo and non-homo uh, species that had branched um, from this long branch. And things changed in the last few years uh, with the advance, uh, the, the great advance in the ability to sequence uh, ancient DNA, meaning to take uh, archaeological remain like bone or, to or teeth, sometimes hair, and extract DNA uh, from it and then uh, the, um, uh, to sequence it and read it. So it is very difficult to do because ancient DNA is highly degraded, it is fragmented, it is, uh, there, there are chemical modifications to the DNA that changes the identity of the nucleotides. So it's, it's a difficult task and it took, uh, I would say, several decades for the technology to, um, to mature. Uh, but uh, in, the, in recent years we are in the position that we have the full genome in high quality of uh, two of our closest evolutionary relatives, the Neanderthal and the Denisovan. And uh, that means that now it's the first time that we have the opportunity to directly compare our present day human genome to that, to that of our closest evolutionary relative rather than to our closest living relatives. And if we do such a comparison and then we do identify something that is unique to humans in the genome, then we can be certain that it uh, had been acquired during this short branch here and it is really something that characterizes our own kind and it may be associated with human-specific phenotypes or human-specific traits. And so uh, this is a, a, a rough glimpse uh, on the uh, human evolution during the last two million years. Um, so what you see here is this line is the present and when you go down the slide you're going uh, back in time and this is 1.8 million years ago and so also you see here geographical information by the different continents. This is Africa, Europe, Asia and Oceania and so you can see that uh, by large human uh, populations evolved in Africa and there were these uh, out of Africa events where populations uh, migrated out of Africa. Uh, this one here is a very famous uh, out of Africa event leading to, um, um, to kinds of humans that spread throughout the world. And uh, what is more relevant to, to my talk today is uh, a, another out of Africa event here um, that led to uh, um, um, entrance into Europe and Asia of human populations that later became the Neanderthals here you see residing in Europe and a bit in Africa and the Denisovans that 
are residing in Asia and in, in parallel uh, other human populations keep on evolving in uh, Africa. So at this point in time there were no Homo sapiens, no Neanderthals. There were, this was just the common ancestors but then they later became uh, Homo sapiens in Africa and Neanderthal and Denisovans and uh, we all lived in parallel to each other uh, for hundreds of thousands of years. And then there was um, another big out of Africa event 50, 60 a thousand years ago, uh, well, here it's already Homo sapiens and it spread through um, the world and, uh, <clears throat> and there um, uh, may be encounters between um, uh, humans and other kinds of human groups living in the world. Uh, nobody really knows what happened in, during these encounters, but uh, the, we all know the final outcome, outcome that we are the only surviving kind of human in the world and all the other human groups went extinct. And there is a very fascinating question of what happened during these encounters and what led to our survival. It, it may be just luck because you know there was one survival and it, it, it happened to be us otherwise I wouldn't have been talking to you today as, as a homo sapiens. Uh, so it may be luck uh, but maybe it was some kind of advantage and there are, um, and there are many, many theories about what potential advantages we may have carried over, um, over uh, our relatives and it is absolutely not clear when you look at, uh, at, uh, at a Neanderthal. Uh, it's very similar to human in many, in many respects. If you look at brain size, so the brain size is more or less the same, it's even slightly be bigger in Neanderthal. And so you don't, and you know, Neanderthals, uh, there are mm, many evidence indicating um, different levels of culture. Um, it's debated what, exactly what kind, what level of the culture, but definitely they had some kind of culture. Uh, they used stone tools, they used fire, so you don't see any clear uh, differences. And, um, and uh, by the way, this I wanted just to show you about the Denisovans. Um, so the, the Denisovans is this group here and we don't know how it looked like because, because all that uh, is known about the Nisovan is this tiny uh, bone at the end, very end of the pinky and a few teeth and from this, um, from this bone that was uh, preserved very, um, very well in, in this uh, the Nisovan cave in the um, Altai mountains in Siberia uh, um, the high quality genome of the Denisovan was uh, sequenced. So eventually Denisovans, Neanderthals, they all went extinct and we survived and there is a very interesting question of why did we survive? And it's, it's a very difficult question to answer because you need some evidence and some proof and uh, with the uh, ability to sequence and to read the DNA of Neanderthals and Denisovans uh, it was intriguing to think that maybe we can read something in the genome that may help us in answering these questions. Um, so, of course, this was um, realized by the first, uh, those that first sequenced the Neanderthals and the Denisovans and comparisons of the genome started right away. And I will um, just tell you here shortly about some famous examples. One of them is the MRC1 gene, which is a pig pigmentation gene and a certain mutation in human is known to render the um, protein a bit less effective, resulting in fair skin and red hair. And a different mutation, not the same one, uh, a different mutation was found in the MRC1 of Neanderthals, but it is uh, estimated that the outcome, the, the phenotypic outcome of the mutation is the same. Meaning uh, that Neanderthals had fair skin and red hair and if you look on, in Google uh, in recent reconstructions of Neanderthals they are always uh, with uh, red hair and fair skin. Another very famous example is the FOXP2 gene uh, we, and this gene is, uh, it has two uh, very interesting properties that made it a very um, good candidate for comparison with regard to language acquisition. 
One property of FOXP2, the FOXP2 gene is that is, it is highly conserved. So if you compare our resulting protein to that of mouse, there are only three amino acid differences. Uh, but uh, so it is highly conserved and yet it had accelerated evolution in humans. So if you compare the human version to the chip version, out of the three amino acid changes that we share with, that we have with respect to mouse, we have two with respect to chimp. So from chimp to mouse, it's only one change. And then from chimp to, uh, to us, it's, it's two changes. And there are other indications for accelerated evolution of this gene specifically in human. The, the second important property of this gene is that it is associated with uh, um, grammatical understanding. So people with defected FOXP2 uh, they are not only incapable of properly pronouncing sounds, th this also happens, but what is more interesting is that they have difficulties in grasping grammatical structure of languages. And so FOXP2 gene uh, is, for these reasons, is one of the uh, flagships of speech capability. And um, so immediately the FOXP2 uh, version of Neanderthals was compared to that of human to see whether it's more similar to the human version or more similar to the chimp version. And the uh, famous, very famous result is that um, it's identical to, to the human version. So you cannot genetically rule out um, um, th their ability to, to speak. And so now when we have uh, the full genome, uh, such comparisons can be made on a large scale like uh, cataloging all the known differences in the gene sequence and all the known differences that result in different proteins. And you have a catalog, you have hundreds of such changes. But then there is a, another problem. So you have a change in amino acid, so the protein that the human produces and the protein that the Neanderthal produces are a bit different. But then there is the question, what is the biological meaning of this difference? And usually when you try to estimate the, the, the functional meaning of the difference, you find very, very small effects. So we do have a catalog of changes, but uh, for the majority of cases, it doesn't, we don't see any clear indication that it does anything significant to, to, to our biology. Uh, and yet we, we, we see, um, we, we know a lot about Neanderthal morphology from, from the paleontological remains, we know that phenotypically we are very different. So the question is, where do all these phenotypic differences come from? And the situation somewhat resembles um, the situation uh, maybe four decades ago, when the first human and chimpanzee sequences started to emerge and people notice how similar we are. And then people started asking, okay, if we are so similar genetically, where do all these uh, differences between us come from and um, and since the, and it was then suggested and since then became a cornerstone in evolutionary thinking is that many of the phenotypic differences between closely related species may be attributed to changes in gene regulation rather than to changes in the gene sequence. So the gene regulation determines when, how, and where a gene is expressed in the body. And even if the gene is identical, changes in its regulation may lead to uh, very significant phenotypic effects. And so the question that I asked in my lab was, can we take these ancient DNA sequences which, and say anything about how the genes worked, about anything about regulatory programs in these um, uh, ancient um, humans. And uh, it, on, first, on the first thought, it sounds not really feasible because the ancient DNA sequence, sequences are highly degraded. They are broken. You cannot examine directly how they work. They are not in any cellular context. So how, how can you examine in the lab how the, the DNA work. So uh, I don't know if you can examine in the lab, but we came up with uh, several ideas on how you can uh, still look at this sequence, ancient sequence DNA and say something about uh, the gene regulation. And uh, I will uh, describe our work that was published uh, in Science last year. 
and we were focusing on DNA methylation. So what is DNA methylation? Um, normally we are used to think on DNA as if it is made of four letters, A, C, G, and T, uh, and it looks like this, but uh, sometimes it is uh, more appropriate to think of the DNA as if it is made of five letters because the C can go through a chemical modification known as methylation. And uh, in fact, when you look at the, the, the DNA sequence, uh, some of the Cs are methylated. Here this is indicated by the uh, black, uh, by the orange dot above it. And uh, so there are Cs that are methylated and Cs that are, that are non-methylated. And what does it have to do with uh, gene regulation? So it has a lot to do with gene regulation. If we look at the schematic part of, of the genome uh, that m uh, is made, we see here two genes, gene one and gene two, then you can schematically look at the, methyla at the DNA methylation in three different regions. Perhaps the most studied is the promoter region, the, the region just upstream or before the gene. And this region is very, very important for the regulation of the gene because many of the instructions of how, when, and where to uh, um, use the gene is encoded here in this promoter region. And a, a very strong asso association is known to exist between DNA methylation in the promoter region and the level of activity of the gene. Very basic, very roughly, if the promoter is methylated, so the Cs in the promoter region are methylated, uh, the gene is silenced. And on the contrary, if the gene is active, uh, its promoter is unmethylated. That means that if I can tell you the level of DNA methylation of the promoter, I can tell you a lot about the activity level of this gene. Now, methylation is also known to be related to the gene activity in the gene body. Throughout the gene, methylation here, uh, the relation between methylation and expression in this case is less obvious because there are different cases. But it, one thing is very, very clear, that if you significantly change the methylation pattern along a gene, it has a significant effect on the regulation. It's harder to tell exactly to what direction is the effect, but there is a strong effect. So again, if we can show a gene whose body is significantly different in its methylation pattern between modern humans and Neanderthals, we can say that the genes were uh, walking in a different way. The third part is intergenic regions, regions that are far from genes. And here uh, DNA methylation has uh, one role in silencing transposable elements, that's one thing. But another important role of intergenic methylation is the, in the activity level of what is called enhancers and silencers and, um, uh, and other uh, remote regulatory regions. So the regulatory instruction of how a gene works, they are written, many of them are written here, but some of them are located in remote places, maybe very far from the gene itself. These are small elements that are called enhancers. If they enhance the, act the activity of the genes, they may call repressors if they repress the activity of the gene. But it is it was also shown that DNA methylation controls the uh, activity of these elements as well. So we see that DNA methylation is very important um, to our ability to infer about the activity level of genes uh, in many, many different places uh, along the genome. And the big question was, can we say, now we found a, a DNA of Neanderthal that used to live 50,000 years ago, we can sequence its DNA, can we say how was its methylation pattern when it was still alive? Is it possible? And the answer is yes. And now I'm going to show you how. And uh, we are just lucky in this case. We are lucky because the DNA degrades. So ironically, if the DNA would, wouldn't have been degraded, uh, we, we couldn't uh, use our method. So our method can be used only on ancient DNA. It will not work on modern DNA. And the thing is that when, when DNA ages, um, except for fragmentation and the, the fact that it's broken, uh, that, that it is broken, the predominant chemical degradation that happens to ancient DNA 
is what is called uh, deamination. Deamination is a chemical modification that again uh, um, happens to cytosines, to the C in the DNA. And what it does, it makes it, instead of C, another nucleotide. So it changes the identity of the C, which is a big problem when you sequence a DNA. And so, and we are even more lucky because of the effect that if the C is methylated or if it's unmethylated, they degrade into a slightly different products. So if a C is methylated, it degrades into T, a thymine, another known letter in the DNA. But if the C is unmethylated, it degrades into U, which is uracil, which is a, another nucleotide that is not found normally in the DNA. It is found in the RNA. And so normally, uh, DNA sequencing machines do not make a difference between T and U. They cannot tell the difference. They read both as if, it, as, as if they were T. Okay, but in the world, but you normally do not expect to see use in, the, in DNA. But the only uh, realm in, in, in where you do expect to find use is in the world of ancient DNA. So in ancient DNA, you do see use in the DNA because of the degradation. And when you see a U, and you, if you put it like this in the sequencer, you will think that T is written here. But if you see a U, it's definite, it is surely a mistake in your sequencing, right? Because you, originally it was C. So there is an incentive to get rid of this U. Every U that you see in an ancient DNA sequence is necessarily an error. And therefore, uh, protocols were developed by the uh, labs that sequenced ancient DNA to trim the use uh, um, using chemical processes in the preparation of the DNA to sequences, to sequencing. So there are uracil removal protocols. Like they take the use and they remove it from the reads. And when you remove the uracil, you introduce an asymmetry between the T's and the U's. And we can take advantage of this asymmetry to uh, tell you what was the uh, ancient methylation level. And what's the idea? Suppose this is the DNA sequence uh, of, a, of a happily living Neanderthal. And suppose that there there is a methylated region here and an unmethylated region here. And then the Neanderthal die, dies and uh, degradation starts. And then after 50,000 years, we find its DNA. And when we find the DNA, it looks like this. So um, the, the degradation is, uh, is a random process. So some of the C's here become T because the, these are methylated C's. And some of the C's here become U because uh, the, this is the unmethylated region. And then uh, we prepare the DNA, this DNA for sequencing and during this preparation we remove uracil. So this, these are the sequences that the machine sees when it makes the sequences. And then here you can do something very simple. Uh, we measure what we, could, what, what, we could, what we call the C to T ratio. What is the C to T ratio? We look at all the positions where we know that in modern human you have C. And then we look what do we see in this position in the Neanderthal reads. And the idea is this. In positions that are C in modern human and that they were degraded to T because the C was methylated, we will see some T's here. So if we look at the C to T ratio, which tells you basically what is the fraction of T's in this position, you will see here in this region some appreciable fraction of T's. Okay, but what will we see in this region? You, we will we expect to see negligible uh, C to T ratios. Okay, because all the C's that had been degraded ha uh, were removed, were removed from the sequences, and so we don't see them. So we see only C's, no T's. Okay, so this gave gave us the idea that the level of C to T, the C, the C to T ratio, may be correlated with the level of methylation before the Neanderthal died. So we wanted to test it. And uh, for this reason, uh, <coughs> we, look, we took all the C positions in, uh, in, in a bone of modern human. And we divided all these C positions into 10 groups according to the methylation level in modern humans. This is what you see here along the x-axis. So this is the group of all the C positions that 
in, in modern humans have very low methylation, between 0 to 9 percent. And this is the group of Cs in modern humans that have the highest methylation levels. And then in each group we look at what is the average C to T ratio in Neanderthal or in Denisovan. And what we got was an amazing, almost uh, straight line, meaning that C to T ratio is not just a rough proxy for the um, level of DNA methylation in the ancient sample, but it is actually a very accurate and linear measure for the level of uh, C to T methylation. And this is what we evolutionarily expect to see such a picture because we know that us and the Neanderthal are very similar and so we expect that the vast majority of our methylation patterns would be identical. So I hope this convinces you that this is indeed the case in, in a global look when you look at the entire genome. But we wanted to see how it looks at the uh, regional level. And uh, this is an example. Just, this is a part of the human genome. And you see here three different genes. Now I would just say that what I'm showing here is always not the entire G DNA sequence, but only the C positions, only the positions that are interesting for us. So this is the um, entire, uh, uh, this is a part of, of a human chromosome, and these are measured uh, methylation levels in modern human bone. And this is color coded, so green is low methylation and red is high methylation. So this is known to be the methylation pattern in modern humans, and this is a typical example where you see regions that have high methylation followed by regions that have low methylation, then again high methylation, low methylation, and so on and so forth. And this is how the reconstructions in Neanderthal and in Denisovan look like. And generally, this is what you see. A beautiful match, I think, between the modern methylation pattern and the archaic methylation pattern. Look, for example, at this region here. It has low methylation in modern human and also low methylation in Neanderthals and in Denisovan. And that, that is what you normally see. So all very similar and this is what we expect. But then again, what we are interested in are not the similarities but uh, the differences. And uh, here you can see the difference, uh, an example for the differences. Uh, so this is a region of the human uh, genome that is part of the HOXD cluster, which is a, a very important developmental cluster. I will talk about it uh, also in the next slide. And this is the measured methylation in modern human, and you see that by large the entire region is unmethylated in modern human bones. Uh, and then uh, these are the reconstructions in Neanderthals and in Denisovan, and you can clearly see that uh, the methylation pattern there is very distinctively different. So there are regions here with high methylation. Interestingly, two of them are just in the promoter region. You see this? Two of them are in the promoter region of the gene, meaning in the most important part of the DNA that controls the activity of the gene. Two are in the gene body and one is a, a, in an intergenic region in between, but that is a region that is known to host um, regulatory elements affecting the uh, activity of these genes. Um, the problem with this, or I wouldn't say a problem, but a, a concern is that these are single samples. So we have one Neanderthal that is sequenced, one Denisovan that is sequenced, and on, only one human bone. Um, so, and uh, methylation is known to be variable. It is affected by factors like sex, like age, like tissue, of course, what tissue you're looking at. Uh, it is affected by ethnical background. So many factors affecting the, um, the level of methylation. So we thought, who can tell us, who, how can we say that this region is not a highly variable region that just by chance has low methylation in the single sample that we have. So we, can, we do not have much control over the Nisovans and Neanderthals. Uh, there are only one highly, uh, high quality uh, genomes of them, but we have lots of uh, human uh, DNA methylation measurements. Not on bones, but on many di other different tissues. Here you see just a small sub-collections. We already have, uh, have over 200 such measurements of DNA methylation in modern human 
And what you see here are measurements in 21 different tissues in, for 25 different individuals of both sexes, of many different ethnical backgrounds, of ages range, ranging from 6 to 88. So basically, the variability here between the samples covers all the known factors that affect DNA methylation. And yet, you see that the entire region in modern human is unmethylated, regardless of all these factors. No matter what is your ethnic, ethnical background, sex, age, it doesn't matter, Every, it is always unmethylated. So clearly, the Neanderthal and the Denisovan uh, meth DNA methylation pattern is outside of the normal variability in modern human population. Uh, in this particular case, uh, this is a, a very interesting example because this is, <coughs> this is an example where we can associate the differences in the activity level of the genes with phenotypic effects. So one thing that is very important to mention is that uh, if you take these two genes, the HOXD9 and HOXD10, the protein sequence is identical between humans and Neanderthals. It's completely the same uh, protein. But our reconstructions show that the genes worked differently. And so the problem is that these are very fundamental um, developmental uh, transcription factors, these two genes, so you cannot play in humans too much with them, but there are experiments in rodents, in mice and in rats. So you can go to the literature and see what are the phenotypic effects of inactivation of HOXD9 and HOXD10 in rodents, and then you can list uh, what the, the resulting phenotypes, so these genes are known to be invo involved in limb development. And so you, you see lots of phenotypes uh, related to limb morphology. And then you can go and um, make a list of the known phenotypic differences between humans and Neanderthals in the limb morphology. And the list is uh, precisely identical. This suggests that this difference in it's only differences in the activity level. Remember that the genes products themselves are identical. So these changes in the regulation of the gene may lie behind all the known differences between us and the Neanderthals in limb morphology. Uh, so this is just one example. We could run the algorithm to detect um, these differential methylations uh, in a, th throughout the entire genome. And so we could identify uh, lots of regions whose methylation is different between uh, the three human groups, Neanderthals, Denisovan, and present-day humans. And so we found uh, hundreds of, um, uh, it's called DMRs, it's differentially methylated region. So we could find hundreds of DMRs. Uh, some of them, we find that the methylation status in the Denisovan is one thing and the methylation status in modern humans and the Neanderthal is different. And these are called uh, uh, Denisovan specific DMRs. So we could, we, we could find Denisovan specific DMRs. These are means that the change in the DNA methylation happened along this lineage here. And we could find a Neanderthal specific DMRs and also perhaps mo what was most interesting for us, for us human specific or present day human specific DMRs, meaning DMRs that either evolved along our own lineage or here uh, along the common ancestor of uh, Denisovan and Neanderthals. And so we could take this list of, which was for us very interesting, the list of all the DMRs that are specific to uh, present day humans. And so they are scattered all over. Some of them are uh, in promoters, some of them are in gene bodies, some of them are intergenic. So we looked now for what I'm going to show you only on these DMRs that are associated with genes, meaning DMRs that are either within the gene body or in the promoter of a gene. And so we can now move from a list of DMRs to a list of genes. So what, what is interesting about these genes? These genes are those whose activity level had changed recently uh, and specifically in uh, present-day humans. And then we could ask, 
where these genes tend to be expressed in the body. And we asked this question and we generated the results using the uh, human body with a heat map. So uh, blue regions are those regions that are depleted with uh, such genes. So not many of our genes happen to be expressed in, the, in these uh, um, body parts. And the more red the body part is, meaning it is more enriched with our list of very interesting and unique um, genes. And this result is, this is probably the reason why I'm now uh, standing in front of you in this conference about the brain, because you can very clearly see what is the, uh, um, the, the body part that is mo most enriched with um, um, these genes that whose um, activity patterns had changed recently in our evolution, and this is the brain. Uh, I must say there are other um, body systems that are enriched with such gene genes, and this is very interesting. They include the cardiovascular system, um, the immune system, and the skeletal system, but by far the most enriched part is the human brain. And uh, we could do also another thing with uh, this list of genes. So now we have this list of genes that is very interesting, and we know that many of them are in the brain. And now we can take um, this list of genes and ask another question. Uh, if you take a gene by random and you ask whether it is associated with a known human disease, just by chance, uh, you have a, a, almost 11% chance of picking a ge the gene that is associated with a disease. But in our group of these interesting genes that changed in humans specifically, this number almost doubles. So many of them, of our genes, tend to be associated with human diseases. And when you look at these diseases, then about one third of them are uh, neurological uh, disorders, like schizophrenia, like autism, like Alzheimer. And so um, if you combine this to the previous result, this offers a, a, an evolutionary scenario. I must uh, be cautious here and tell you that this is not the only explanation, but this is a very interesting offer that we, a suggestion that we can make, uh, an ev and very interesting evolutionary story that we can offer, and it still have to be tested. And the thing is that although the brain size is the same between us and the Neanderthals, these results show that the inner working of the brain was probably very different. So there were many. Um, many um, genes that started to work in a bit different way in the brain. Whether it has or did not have cognitive consequences, I cannot tell you, but something in the brain was very different. Perhaps conferring has, uh, us uh, with some different cog uh, cognitive abilities, um, and, and perhaps these changes in the brain also had side effects. Uh, in the form of all these um, um, psychiatric disorders that we now see associated with these genes. Uh, <clears throat> how much time do I have? Seven minutes. Seven minutes, okay. Um, and so uh, I told you that um, DNA methylation is found all over, and until now I told you only about the DNA methylation that is connected with two genes. Uh, but we also found, find a, a considerable uh, a proportion of the DMRs, about one third, in intergenic regions. So what you see here is each circle is the, uh, those DMRs that are specific to one of the um, uh, human groups. So these are the Nisovan specific DMRs, present day human specific DMRs, Neanderthal specific DMRs, and you see that everywhere about one third of the DMRs are found in intergenic regions. So we wanted to ask whether uh, these intergenic DMRs also can be connected to uh, changes in the gene activity levels. And so what we can do is the following. Uh, there are many known um, histone modification marks uh, that, um, that signal or mark um, 
an intergenic region in the genome that uh, has regulatory activity. Specifically, uh, we used here, here several different uh, such um, histone modification and uh, protein binding sites that are known to be strongly associated with enhancers. And uh, the CTCF uh, mark, which is known to be associated with insulators. So it doesn't really matter what exactly do they do, but these are two different kinds of remote regulatory elements. And the thing is that in the human genome, we can use uh, different measurements of different kinds of signals or marks on the DNA that can mark you where there are enhancers and where there are insulators. And then we could test for each of the three groups of um, our DMRs whether they overlap or not um, enhancers and insulators. So what you see here is the, the following. The orange is the number of DMRs that overlap insulators and the different shades of blue is the um, uh, number of DMRs that overlap different marks, different number of marks that mark enhancers. Basically, if you sum both of them, the orange and the blue, uh, you get the total number of DMRs that overlap any kind of remote regulatory element in the intergenic regions. And so you see that in all uh, three uh, kinds of humans, um, DMRs um, have a strong tendency to overlap uh, regulatory intergenic regulatory regions. This is, of course, you, you can show by um, making different kinds of randomization and shuffling that this is highly statistic, uh, statistically significant. So DMRs tend to overlap enhancers and uh, insulators or more generally uh, intergenic regulatory regions. Another question that we wanted to ask is uh, can we provide some explanation for the hundreds of changes uh, in, in, in DNA methylation between us and uh, our closest evolutionary relatives. And one scenario that we had in mind is the following. So we have been looking at DNA methylation and I told you that if the promoter of a gene is methylated, the gene is silenced. And there is a big question and debate in the literature whether um, uh, DNA methylation is causative or not causative to gene silencing. And the, the point is that DNA methylation is probably both. So DNA methylation can, so the promoter can become methylated and then the gene will be silenced. Or if a gene is silenced by other means, after it is silenced, the DNA methylation comes and come and like uh, gives the final stamp that this gene is silenced. And so the important point here is that you can see methylation in the promoter region of genes that were silenced by other means. And this gave us the following idea. So there are genes that are called transcription factors, that they are responsible for the activity of many, many other genes. They are called their targets. So a single transcription factor can have dozens or even hundreds of targets. And our idea that it was that if, if there was an evolutionary ev um, um, change in the activity level of a single transcription factor, it may affect the, the activity level of hundreds or tens or hundreds of other genes, and then we will see it in the DNA methylation. So the question that we asked is this. We take all the genes in which we see these DNA methylation changes, and we ask whether do we see there a transcription factor and an enriched set of its targets. Then it would indicate that maybe this was the evolutionary scenario that had been in, in, um, in action. And this is indeed what we see. We identify uh, two um, tr such transcription factors in Neanderthals, meaning you see that these trans transcription factors have different methylation pattern in Neanderthal as well as many of them of their targets. And you see three different such transcription factors in humans. Maybe it is closing the loop because one of them is maze one transcription factor, which is the known, which is known to be a major regulator of the HOXD9 and 10 genes that I've been talking earlier. So maybe uh, the change in the maze one activity pattern is the uh, change that actually was behind the activity level change in the HOXD9 and 10 genes. Uh, and this suggests that the evolution of gene regulation 
uh, uh, may progress not in a gradual uh, way of accumulating changes, but in a stepwise evolutionary process where a, where a single evolutionary event can influence the DNA methylation of many uh, genes in a, in a very short evolutionary time. Uh, just to sum up, the method that we, here, uh, that we are here proposing is very, very important, especially, I mean, important to the field of ancient DNA because uh, there, um, if you take an ancient bone and you try to extract endogenous DNA from this bone, usually you end up with just minute quantities, like 1% or so of, the, of what you extract is uh, the DNA of the Neanderthal. The, all the rest are uh, contaminations and uh, bacteria that came to live on the bone afterwards. So uh, there are very small quantities of this DNA. The DNA is very precious and uh, the labs that are doing it are absolutely reluctant in, you know, trying to directly measure the uh, DNA methylation of these sequences because these uh, measurements are destructive. And so this method is co purely computational. We don't have to do anything to the DNA and it gives you a highly accurate DNA methylation map. And also I think this is very interesting because this was this, this was our first chance to look at how genes worked in Neanderthals. So not only uh, genes that differ in their sequence, but differ in their uh, activity patterns. And I want to, f to end up with um, uh, thanking those that contribute to this uh, work. Um, um, the, for and foremost, my lab members, and uh, especially to uh, David Gochman, who is uh, my PhD student that uh, is leading this project, and to my collaborator Eran Meshorer from, from here, from, uh, from the genetic department, and uh, to collaborators from the Max Planck Institute, and uh, these two guys from Spain, uh, they are the only uh, ones that make um, um, some kind of limited DNA methylation measurements on human bones because they try to study bone-related diseases. And thank you. We have time for a few questions. We have compared at the beginning to show that there were more methylation according to your work in the ancient uh, species of us and the Homo sapiens, less methylation areas. Did I understand it correctly? No. No. There was one uh, slide that you showed two of them with a lot of area methylation. And oh, ju just in this particular region, but it's not, oh. it's not overall the case. Overall, we have very similar methylation level, but just and some regions are unmethylated in human, other regions are uh, overmethylated in human. I have uh, two questions. One is, uh, if you're taking uh, a is it possible to compare uh, not uh, modern humans, but humans, homo sapiens, uh, that uh, has been, not, uh, you know, ancient homo sapiens. Yeah. Uh, because I think this will give us some kind of clue as to uh, what... Uh, Ab yeah, absolutely. That's yeah, okay. Second, so the question that I'm asking also is how ancient must ancient DNA be in order for you to be able to use this method? The other question is, when you're, uh, t uh, when you're showing us the DMRs, and you're saying, look, the DNA sequence is identical in all these cases, and what we see is a, is a difference in methylation. There are two po possible uh, uh, interpretation of it uh, in, evolution, uh, in evolutionary terms. One is that there is somewhere a mutation which is affecting this DMRs, and the other is that the DMRs themselves are, uh, indicated, are, are changing evolutionarily without changing DNA sequence, which is a more controversial kind of suggestion, but nevertheless not, not one that we can dismiss. So what do you think? Okay, so the first, uh, the first issue is uh, can we use the method for ancient humans or uh, how, uh, how ancient the, the, the specimen had to be in order to be analyzed? So first of all, we do it for humans. Mo for Homo sapiens, I didn't show it here, but we already have uh, the full uh, DNA methylation map along the Ustishim individual. I don't know if you know it. This is the 45,000 Homo sapiens that was found in Siberia, and it has a very high quality 
uh, sequence, so we do have it. It's very similar to modern humans, which is very nice to see. And so we are now in the process of analyzing it. We also uh, can tell you, uh, uh, we also have uh, other two samples that are 7,000 and 8,000 year old, so you can do it for only thousands of year old individuals, you can apply this method more generally. Oh, and we applied it to a mammoth, which is 4,000 year old, and we have a beautiful um, uh, methylation map. So few th a few thousand years are sufficient. More generally, we depend here on the degradation. As I told you, if there is no degradation, the method will not work, and the rate of degradation changes due to different factors. So. Uh, due to the soil composition, due to the temperature, due to many other factors. So, um, uh, so I cannot predict in advance how, um, if, you, if you give me, I have a 4,000 year old sample, I cannot tell you right away if we can or cannot do it. It depends on so many factors and also on the level of uh, DNA coverage. So it depends on many factors, but our empirical, um, uh, our, our experience that says that Normally, a few thousand years are sufficient. As for the second question, this, this was, uh, again, a very interesting question that we asked ourselves. So whether the, um, the changes in the DNA methylation are or can be related to changes in the sequence, although maybe we, we do not know how to interpret them, maybe in a more remote regions. And uh, so we cannot answer because th this is too difficult to say. But what we can say is that you see a strong correlation between sequence changes and methylation changes. So regions that have more methylation changes uh, have more sequence changes. So th this is some kind of indication for the first scenario, but it's definitely not a proof. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. Okay. I guess it's, it should be in English. Huh? Um, is somebody, is, is there anyone that doesn't speak Hebrew? Okay. <laughs> Usually it's a mystery and, and then you realize that everybody speaks Hebrew. Okay. But I'll, I'll switch to English and I'm, I, first of all, thank you for inviting me. It's a pleasure. It's already a second time that I'm here. And I'm going to talk on behalf of anatomy, I know. And uh, I'm, go I'm going to talk about Neanderthal anatomy, and I use the, f I use the uh, phrase phenom. I don't know if it's legitimate at all, but uh, what I mean to say is that I'm not talking about the genome, I'm talking about the Neanderthal anatomy. Well, Neanderthals are fascinated creatures from both uh, historical and from their, anat from their anatomy. Uh, historical, it's first of, they are the first one to be discovered. Uh, as a matter of fact, the first one uh, was discovered even before Darwin. And, uh, and at the time, everybody was so eager to demonstrate that even within human, within human history, uh, we can document evolution. And the Neanderthal, whether, whether it was okay to do it or not, uh, Neanderthal was grabbed like many other fossils and was put right in the middle between a chimp morphology and human. Just to tell you that the Neanderthal is an intermediate between these two forms. I just found a, a book, I thought it's my, my uh, most precious book in my library, but today you can get it for 9.99 in Amazon. And uh, I bought it because it tells you the same concept. It, it tells you the weather of progress in Palestine. And uh, this book was published right after, the, right after the great discoveries in Mount Carmel. And again, it provides this notion that the Neanderthal is just a link uh, leading to modern humans. And this is, of course, a very naive and very outdated uh, uh, concept. You can see, especially in the popular, in the popular uh, uh, 
uh, media, you can see always this sequence with the, 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 the monkey jumping down and then kind of walking and, and obviously Homo sapiens, he's here at, at, the, at the front leading the whole parade. And you can see it here. And I, I call, this is part of my hobby, I collect these uh, cartoons. Uh, of course, in California they are jogging. The, and uh, you can see it here even, you know. And always the Neanderthal is right behind, in a, in a rather stupid uh, expression, behind Homo sapiens. I mean, this was the trend and for many, many years it was a very uh, popular concept. Even today, I would have to say, you see it here, you see the sequence here, <laughs> okay? Now I have to tell you that I got it in the email and I cannot read anything that is here, but nevertheless, this is the most important part. The other, I mean, speaking about the history, the history of science, the other uh, approach uh, was very popular in the 60s. You know, this is the hippies and Marxism and we are one and the pendulum of the Neanderthal interpretation moved to the other side and they said, wait a minute, Neanderthals are very much like us. There is really no difference at all. And there, there is this uh, there is concept or a motif that is called the, the New York subway motif, uh, saying that if a Neanderthal, you can see it here, this gentleman, if a Neanderthal will walk into the subway in New York, Lo Lechinam, the subway of New York, <laughs> and uh, nobody will pay attention, you know, with all the crazy people there. Oh, I mean, there is another one that looks like this. And uh, this was very popular. And today, I feel the pendulum is switching to the other side. But before, I, I, I just want to show you another thing, to, to an indication to Neanderthal is very much like us, Maternis sent me this, uh, this uh, uh, poster and it's hanging outside my office in, in uh, the medical school. And one day I see a student go, walking by in the corridor and I say, wait a minute, I have to go and bring my camera. Because you can see <laughs> that they are the same, we are one, okay? So this is, this is the two the two uh, uh, perceptions or the two uh, notions that actually dominated Neanderthal uh, investigation in, histo in historical perspective. And what I want to tell you, and I'm talking about, you'll see, I, I'm, I'm going to talk about the brain at the end, but uh, what I want you, what I want uh, to do is actually to introduce you to a very unusual anatomy of Neanderthals. I'll start with a very simple thing. So I'm, I'm showing you here a, a Homo sapiens mandible. Each of us has the same mandible. And you can see, of course, we can see the hallmark of the Homo sapiens anatomy is the chin. We can see the, the mandible has an ascending ramus and it's uh, actually terminated with two processes more or less equal in size, the anterior one and the posterior one, and there is a notch that is more or less similar, and the deepest point of the notch is right between the distance of these two processes. And this is obviously the very generalized and a very primitive configuration, because if you go to an orangutan, or if you go to any other chimp or another uh, vervet or monkey, you, you will see the same configuration like us. And I hope I, I'm not insulting anyone, but we have a very primitive, I'm not talking about the chin, but we have in essence a very primitive mandible. Now, when we go to the Neanderthal, the story is quite different. You can see that the anterior process is very tall, very high, the posterior one is low, and you can see very clearly that the notch between them is quite different. I mean, this, this is a magnitude of differences that you don't see between a horse and a donkey today, 
Okay, these are substantial differences. I would like to draw your attention to one more very characteristic, the, it's an iconic uh, anatomy of the Neanderthal. It's called the retromolar space. You can see that this is actually the, the uh, wisdom tooth of the Neanderthal. And you can see that there is a huge uh, gap between the ramus and between the wisdom tooth. Now, this gap here is very important. I mean, clinically, it's very important because we don't have this gap, okay? We don't have this gap. And sometimes, uh, unfortunate uh, individuals, the, the wisdom tooth is actually growing into the ramus with intervention of uh, uh, surgical procedures and things like this. Okay, so these are the two things that I would like to draw your attention to, and I'll elaborate in another few minutes. Now, this morphology, as obvious as it is, today no, no journal will accept it. They'll say, well, it's the same. Okay, I have to quantify it. And there is really, it's, it's a very simple way to quantify it. This is the condyle, the posterior process. This is the anterior process. And you can see that if I take 200 individuals of Homo sapiens, from Eskimos to uh, uh, Australian Aboriginals, you can see that the, this is the distribution and this is the mean. Because what, what I'm doing here, by plotting these curvature on uh, or, or on a set of coordinates, I can actually, I can actually uh, quantify each of these uh, each of these uh, curvature, and you can see this is the mean of Homo sapiens. This is the Neanderthal. A completely different story. And the moment it is quant quantified into variables and. And uh, you, can, you can employ multivariate analysis because I'm talking about 20 variables. You can see very clearly that we are talking about Homo sapiens and we are talking about Neanderthals. There is some overlap. But the important thing is that all these are early uh, forms of uh, Homo, Homo erectus and others, okay? So we can see that this is actually the generalized, the primitive configuration. Neanderthals is, some, is some, something different. Now, when I was studying this, I was sure that I'm a genius, noticing these things, until I came to uh, Zagreb, and uh, somebody showed me a monograph from 1914. This is uh, the old Gorjanovic, Kremberger Gorjanovic, who was excavating in the early 19th, uh, 20th century uh, the Krapina site. And he already noticed this difference. He tried to quantify it in a very peculiar way, but nevertheless, he did notice it. Now, the interesting thing here is that this spectacular monograph in German and Croatian, I ran a Google, and it's not mentioned even once. Okay, not mentioned even once. And it's fantastic, 200 pages of a fantastic monograph. Okay, we'll go back. And, uh, well, originally I thought the coronoid, the, the coronoid is very tall, and uh, the, the condyle, the posterior, uh, the posterior process, is normal in size. Now, I, this was a, an arbitrary decision to take the zero point, okay, this is the zero line, to take and to put all the mandibles on the zero. I could do the same thing with this point and put it on the zero point. And then the condyle will be lower down. And indeed, after looking at it, I mean, this is part of our profession, looking and looking and looking and looking, sometimes for a whole year. I suddenly realized that the, the, the anterior process is normal in size. But what is so very pe peculiar is the, the posterior process. The posterior process is actually the condyle. This is, where, this is the fulcrum point of the mandibular level. 
And it is actually, it's not the coronoid that is tall, but the, the condyle that is very low. Why? We don't know yet. So, in other words, we can see very clearly that the transformation from a generalized configuration of, uh, of a Homo sapiens mandible is by dropping, dropping the condyle. And by dropping the condyle, it enables the, the mandible, it enables it a much larger gape. Okay? Because the lower the condyle is, it's much easier to open the mouth. Why? We don't know. Why? We don't know. So this is it. it this is the generalized mandible. You can see that here and here they are the same. The deepest point of the notch is the same, but what is different here is the low position of the condyle. I mean, there, is, uh, there are ways to express it uh, metrically, and I, I, I won't bother you with, with these details. I just can assure you that these things, uh, in terms of st uh, statistical, sig they are statistical significant. Now, the question is, why to open the mouth so much? And I already told you, I don't know the answer. I spent the whole sabbatical with the expert of mandibular, with mandibular, the expert of um, mandibular biomechanics, and we, c we cannot understand. There is really no, um, no doubt that that's what they did. But why did they do it? We don't know. Okay. So in order, in order to enable the mandible to open very, very wide and to produce a very extreme gape, there are two strategies. The one is to lower, okay, this is the mandible. This is another mandible. So the one is to lower the mandible and then you can see that the gape is much uh, larger. And the other thing is actually to push the dental arcade, the, the dentition, to push forward. Because the forward the dentition is, there is a larger gap between the upper and lower dentition. And the Neanderthal, as we could see, and I'll, sh I'll try to convince you later, the Neanderthal is actually using these two strategies to produce a gap. Why? We don't know. Okay, so, well, I don't want to bother you with this. Uh, oh, one second. The only thing that we can see, if we measure the length, the length of the dental arcade, we can see that this is the length of the dental arcade in Homo sapiens. This is exactly the same, the length of, uh, of uh, Homo erectus, another species of of a, of a homo, and Neanderthals, this is the dental arcade, you can see that it actually moved migrating forward and of course producing the post, uh, the retromolar space that I introduced you before. So what we do, what we see here is actually a drop, a drop of the, of the condyle down but a byproduct of this descent is actually also a movement or a migration forward. We can see it here very clearly. I'm very proud about, about the animation that I produced here. Okay, oppa. <laughs> see it here? That's the whole thing. But you can see that not only that it goes down, but it goes forward. Very important. The moment, uh, well, before I'm dealing with Neanderthal, I would like to show you the mandible and the condyle from above. You can see that the ridge or the notch that is connecting these two processes, as you go back, it diverges lateral and it, it, merges, it merges to the, to the uh, lateral pole of the condyle. This is a very generalized configuration here and here you see the same thing. But what happened with the Neanderthal 
because the condyle is moving forward, you can see that the ridge here, the ridge is actually meeting the condyle in mid width, right in the middle. This is very peculiar morphology. You can see it here. This is Homo sapiens, and this is, you can see, a Neanderthal. Almost a Martian in terms of, a, of, in terms of this morphology. You can see it here. Again, this is from Amud, a, a, a cave that we excavated and the Japanese excavated before us. You can see a very peculiar, I mean, I know Lucy, I know Australopithecines, I know Homo erectus, none of them is something like this. It's really a very peculiar morphology. The other thing that is very characteristic of, uh, of Neanderthal is when you look at the internal aspect of the ramus, you see here a very rugged and very uh, uh, developed process that is actually the site of an insertion for a big and important muscle. It's called the, media, the, the medial pterygoid muscle. And it has to do with closing of the mouth. The, the question is, why is it so rugged at, at this point since the, uh, since the uh, attachment of this muscle is from here to here? Why is it the upper part of the attachment area is so uh, rough? And we can see it here as well. The same thing, and in many, many other Neanderthals. And the reason is very simple. Because the moment you open your mouth to such an extent as I would argue the Neanderthal did, some of these fibers are stretched beyond their physiological uh, capability to contract. And the whole mechanism of closing the mouth is actually depending on these on the upper part of the fibers. This is very interesting because from a biomechanical point of view, it's a disadvantage. But apparently, the Neanderthal uh, facing the dilemma. It's either to make the mandible very efficient and then to give up uh, the gape. The Neanderthal apparently is choosing to produce the gape on the expense of, bi of the biomechanical efficiency. And you can see what I'm talking about. You see, this is, the, this is a muscle. I mean, no matter, uh, this is the lip, but it's a muscle that is, and this, these uh, baboons, the gelada baboon from Ethiopia, they, for, for reasons of display, they open their mouth enormously, and you can see that the lip is actually, f uh, is actually slipping back in order to enable the gape. If, if, if he was interested in producing a bigger gap, gape, he will s flip this or slip this also, and it will produce even a larger gape. The Neanderthal, without, without the lips, but the Neanderthal is doing the same thing. He is, he is actually utilizing the posterior fibers, even though, from a biomechanical point of view, it's a disadvantage. Now, as I told you, I spent the whole sabbatical at Duke University in the, in the medical school there with uh, my dear friend, uh, uh, Bill Highlander. He is really the world expert of biomechanics. And what, uh, what he does, he puts electrodes into the muscle. And since there were no volunteers, and in order to do it on animals today, it will, it will take another five years to wait for a permission. I was the, I was the specimen here. And uh, you cannot see it here, but there are tiny, tiny very thin fi uh, metal fibers that are extending from my muscles. Uh, to the computer and all this. And the, the goal of this, the goal of this uh, experiment, I was chewing on a tennis ball. 
And uh, we were actually checking if indeed the lower fibers of the medial pterygoid, the medial pterygoid is very difficult to reach, it's behind the ramus, if indeed the lower fibers of the medial pterygoid are, are not active, they are not firing. And we found out that indeed it's only the superior fibers that are capable to contract. Now this is uh, a very stupid uh, uh, presentation of me. I'm sitting there chewing on uh, tennis balls and uh, apples and all kind of things. This is a mash of, uh, of copper in order to prevent uh, uh, interference, electromagnetic interference to the experiment. I'll go farther and I'll say that the moment the moment the mandible is actually uh, open extremely big, the, the muscle that is attached here to the anterior, uh, to the anterior uh, process is, is under continuous bending moment more and more. The more you open your mandible, the bending forces are actually uh, larger. And of course, in order to cope with it, you have to transform the upper part of the ramus. Okay, so uh, this is a, a student of mine, an MD that is, wants to be an, an, an uh, physical anthropologist or paleontologist. He, he did his uh, uh, PhD on uh, on finite element, and it's very easy to check it uh, with finite elements. You can see that if you, if you open your mouth, I mean, this is a mandible in an open position, you can see that if this process is pulled upward, like all the muscles that we are using, you can see that it's firing here because it's very un... It's it feels very uneasy here. And this is the translation of this, of this uncomfortable position is these, these many colors. But the moment, the moment you bridge, you bridge this gap and it becomes more and more Neanderthal morphology, this is without bridging it. And slowly, slowly, you can see how the pressure or the bending moment of the coronoid process are eased because of this modification. Okay, how much do I have? Seven. Huh? Seven minutes. Seven minutes. I'll run faster. There is a, there is a, no doubt, I mean, this was, uh, this was noticed many, many years ago, uh, a difference in the, in the anatomy of the, of the facial architecture of the Neanderthals. Some, in early days, some said that it has to do with uh, uh, the, the extreme cold conditions that the Neanderthals were uh, in Europe, and the whole big nose was actually a radiator to to put to introduce heat and uh, humidity into the lungs. This is called the cold adaptation theory. In recent years, and I I am one of the, uh, I am one of those who uh, is trying to advance this theory. We are actually convinced that. This orientation in which the Neanderthal switched the, the bony plate from the generalized position like this into a sagittal uh, orientation, it's because he was using the anterior teeth. In a generalized phase like ours, the moment you are using the anterior teeth, you put a, a, a serious load on the anterior teeth, you instantly feel very uncomfortable and automatically you take let's say the very stubborn pistachio that you are trying to crack and you move it to the posterior teeth 
Why? Because the posterior teeth are the place to anticipate these uh, powers or these loads. Neanderthal, because he was so much interested in, in producing a large gape, was using the anterior teeth to chew on them. Again, why? We don't know. And in order to modify the, skelet the, the bony skeleton, or the, the facial bony skeleton, to this pressure, the obvious thing is to, to change the orientation from a sagittal to a lateral, I'm sorry, from a sagittal to a sagittal, from a, uh, from a frontal to a sagittal orientation, because in a sagittal orientation, it can resist much better the load on the anterior teeth. This is, in essence, what happened. It, it's an upheaval in the, and you can see very clearly, we can see it from the fossils themselves, you can see that the anterior teeth are indeed extensively worn, so extensively worn that there is no enamel left. And this chap is a, is a Iraqian Neanderthal. He's actually chewing on the root of the teeth. And you can see it here very clearly, okay? The root of the teeth are exposed and this is where the load uh, was taking place. Uh, I'll take you to this cave, and this is the Amud. In the 60s, the Japanese were excavating there, and I, as a young, as a young uh, pupil, I was then in uh, Kita Yud, as we say, uh, or, or, or Tetafilu, uh, I heard in the news that the Japanese found a caveman, and I was in Hadassim at that time, and I did something that is unheard of today. I hitchhiked and visited, visited this cave. I went up here, and I saw the Japanese. I mean, uh, it wasn't only the, on, the, on, the, the only uh, Neanderthal that I ever saw, but it was the first Japanese that I saw. And, uh, uh, this was Professor Suzuki, and uh, in the 60s, we took uh, upon ourselves to renew the excavation. This is up in the, and this is the old trench of the, of the uh, Japanese, and we were lucky enough to excavate here something that the Japanese left untouched, and to discover a Neanderthal baby. You can see it here, it looks like an omelette, but you can see this is the mandible, this is part of the, part of the skull, the ribs, the clavicle, the, uh, the pelvis, and others. Now, why is it so important? Here, this is the mandible. It was very clear. Even though the baby was nine months old, it was very clear that it's a Neanderthal. And why am I so excited about this fact? Because a well-known uh, phenomenon or a well-known fact in biology is that it, the, the, the taxonomic identity of very uh, immature individual is much harder to tell than the adult one. And here, I mean, you have difficulties you have difficulties to, uh, to uh, distinguish between a, ch a chimp at nine months and a human nine months, okay? And here we can tell with no difficulties at all that we are talking about Neanderthal. And this is the, this is the Neanderthal, uh, Neanderthal baby. And one of, of course, there is no chin. And the other thing that is very peculiar, and we have no idea what it means, the foramen magnum, you can see, the foramen magnum is very strange in its shape. We have a round foramen magnum. Many other primates have a round foramen magnum. Neanderthals, they have a very oval one. And maybe it has to do, because 
from an embryological point of view, uh, the face and the base of the skull are the same thing. Maybe it's a pleiotropic effect. The selection is on the face, and a byproduct of what's going on there is affecting also the uh, the foramen magnum or the base of the, the base of the skull. You can see it here. This is the amut specimen. This is a. a uh, uh, NGs, yeah. yeah, I think from uh, from uh, Belgium, a very peculiar thing. We don't understand why, and it really doesn't matter. It tells you actually that the Neanderthal, the Neanderthal, is a different story from us. And why is it so important that we recognize it in early age? Because it tells you how severe or how uh, extreme is the, the deviation from us in terms of phylogeny. Because the earlier you find these signs, earlier ontogenetically, the more extreme is the deviation the phylogenetically. Okay, well, I promised you to, and I'll finish with this, I'll, I'll, I'll promise to talk about the brain. This is the sequence, but Homo sapiens is not the one with the largest brain. Neanderthal has 15, some, some even say 20% larger brain. Nevertheless, nobody will say that he is intelligent. I'm, I'm sorry, even the archaeologists. It, there is really no doubt that Neanderthal is very impoverished with, cultural, with the cultural uh, manifestation of what he does. There are no, uh, no uh, uh, art manifestation, no uh, 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 paintings, and no uh, bo uh, bones that are elaborated. There is really nothing. They do bury their dead. But uh, you cannot ex uh, escape the feeling when you excavate them that it is impoverished in comparison to Homo sapiens. Some said, like uh, Richard Klein from Stanford, some said that actually the speciation to Homo sapiens happened only about 30, 40,000 years ago. And part of the manifestation of this speciation is not an anatomical uh, manifestation, but actually the culture, the very rich culture that appears suddenly. And it appears suddenly with all kind of uh, expression. Beautiful art and beautiful uh, uh, bone tools and other things. And I wouldn't say that he doesn't have a point here. If what, what I'm saying here is even though the Neanderthal has a much larger brain, it doesn't say a thing, okay? That's what uh, you were actually saying. It doesn't, or did you? No, I was <laughs> Okay, you phrase it differently. But, uh, but anyway, this is what I want to say. And the Neanderthal has a larger brain and we don't know why. You can see that the brain is, is actually halved to the to this facial skeleton in a different way. It is a different configuration. And it has nothing to do with, as, as, uh, as I'm sure it's, it's, uh, it's uh, obvious to you, uh, that there is really very little to do the size of the brain and intelligence, okay? And, uh, about, uh, about uh, 10 years ago, there was a fascinating uh, article in Science about the brain of uh, birds. And, uh, and these, these birds, okay, uh, I know the anatomy, I know the anatomy of the brain very well, and I was astonished how different the anatomy of the brain is. Nevertheless, and this is part of this article as, an, as a supplementary uh, thing. 
and I hope it will work well. They, they give an example, yeah? They give an example of a raven trying, he wasn't trained, trying to pick up a basket with food in this uh, glass cylinder. And please note what's going on here. Okay, it's, it's spooky. This is really spooky. Just to tell you that, as, and I'm sure that you are very much aware of it as, as people that deal with brain, that there is really, what, what really account, accounts here is the architecture and other things than brain capacity. And the Neanderthal is just one example of it. And I'll finish, if I still have, and I'll finish with the, um, with a ve very popular item in recent years, uh, claiming that Neanderthal and humans exchange genes. And I don't think they did. And I'll tell you, uh, first of all, simply on the basis of the, the, the unbelievable differences, anatomical differences between them that exceeds what we, with our yardstick of living animals, uh, know from the animal kingdom today. How can we explain that uh, the, 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 how do you say, the drift of uh, Neanderthal genes into Homo sapiens? It's not through the uh, crossbreeding between Homo sapiens and Neanderthal. Because uh, we know, and this is by, by the account of the geneticists themselves, we know that Homo sapiens is only 200,000 years. We know again, and maybe less, and we know by the account of the geneticists themselves, that Neanderthal is 600,000 uh, years old and maybe more. So in order that these two branches will meet to a common ancestor, we are missing several players here. And through these players, I am convinced, the, the genes are introduced uh, into our own genome. We can see it here very well. This is Homo sapiens. And there are several other branches. We don't, we cannot point, we, can, we don't recognize them, but they are there on a, on a, on a theoretical uh, basis. And apparently the, neand the, the uh, stepping, the stepping stone of DNA, of Neanderthal DNA is through these through these uh, missing uh, players. And that's about it. Now, I was talking about Neanderthals. My dear friends, the, the geneticists, that's what they know about Neanderthal. This is the piece from uh, Zagreb, or from uh, Vindia, uh, that uh, was identified by Tim White, a paleontologist, as part of a Neanderthal tibia. Thank you. I didn't get it. I think the question, first of all, if you can go back to the scatter plot where we sh you show the Neanderthal population, the Neanderthal remains, and the human populations from, uh, uh -huh. from today. Oh, so there is a, a slight overlap. overlap. Yeah. The, and, and 
claim here is maybe yeah. that you should expect I know, a because game for these I know. individuals. Uh, the, the overlap is there because in general I measure the, the curvature. If I, was to, if I was to choose the most responsible element of this curvature, there is no L, uh, overlap. Is, is this understood? Yeah. I, uh, this mystery about the gate, uh, is it uh, is there any other animal, uh, any other uh, mammal, for example, where you see a, a, a change in uh, this jaw anatomy, yeah. which can tell you something Oh yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. There are there are several several mammals, and I'm talking about mammals. Uh, they produce a large gape. Some of them, uh, it's not to close the mouth, but in order to clear the canines. Okay, because the canines are so big. Uh, some of them are for display, like what we see here. Another example of a display is the hippo. The, they, they actually display. And the same thing happens there and many, many other carnivores, by the way. Many other carnivores in order to be able to, you know, grab an, a, a, a prey, they have a huge uh, gape. Uh, I, wouldn't, I, I would hesitate to say that the Neanderthals are carnivores. Uh, carnivores, does in it, a sense. Does it have any effect on the vocal uh, production in these animals? Uh, I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. Could it be that there were dead animals in the picture you've shown, but on the front teeth, the nerves were even exposed? Oh, yeah. So how long can you live in such a way? Well, he died. <laughs> Yeah. You know, yeah, but but this is a, this is a, a this is a very common question. You know, did it help them? Okay, it didn't, because because what happens is if if the um, if the erosion of the teeth is gradual enough, the de there is a mechanism of dentin building from underneath. Okay, but they do have. I mean, to be a Neanderthal. It wasn't a picnic. Many of them, they have terrible abscesses, and they, it, it was very hard life. But the um, bringing forward of the front teeth with the change in the bones, that reduced the leverage that... I know. So that they could bite, but they couldn't bite Put, that hard. Yeah, that's exactly what I meant by saying that for some reason, the Neanderthals, they prefer the gape on, on, and, and they gave up the as advantages, the biomechanical advantages. A, what? Yeah. For the grain, the what? Grain, the graining was less good because the liver was smaller. I know, I know. Now you, we, we are very much aware of it. Yeah. So about the proportions between the different lobes. Uh, yeah, the proportions. Uh, uh, for, uh, develop, development, the, yeah. The well. Yeah. Uh, the, the, I mean, in general, the the brain is divided more or less uh, the way we have it divided. You know, with uh, with the major lobes and things like this. There is really, I mean, the, the guy that is dealing or dealt with it a lot is uh, Ralph Holloway. And he, he pointed it out that the frontal, lo the frontal lobe is much smaller. The occipital lobe with the, and I didn't go into these details, but with the, an enormous chignon that is, is uh, protruding back is different also. Um, we are very limited beyond, you know, what, what the fossil tells us. Um, by the way, Ralph Holloway, he attributes the, the large brain capacity to a lot of fat that was, nece that was necessary in very cold condition. Okay, that's what he's, he attributes the difference in. Okay, thank you very much.
I'd like to thank all the speakers today, and especially Cheryl here, who was the one organizing and taking care of the, uh, all the technical and the technical. And I hope to see you in the next uh, JBC event.